So let's continue. You just, where do we see? I I'd like to tell. Let's continue with uh, the hating belief, or you can call it several things. Belief that causes the hating, or whatever you want to call it. But we're in our source text is James 1, 19-21. And we'll be there after a little while tonight. But when we closed last week, we were discussing the reception of the Word. And we were... Uh, we had noted that James gives us three things in our, in our source scripture that are important in regards to our reception of the Word. That's where we ended last week. And remember, what we're uh, examining is how James in this letter, uh, how he says that our beliefs should shape our behaviors. Got that? Beliefs shape behaviors. And thus uh, the title, Behaving Beliefs. But let's review a little, and this is where uh, we'll start tonight. So, a right response to the word involves three things. And the number one thing uh, for us to be able to receive the Word of God is for us to have a willingness, uh, we need to have a, a willingness to be submissive, or we need to submit. Uh, we need a willingness to receive the Word with submission, okay? In your outline, you can put the word submission is okay. And remember we said that unbelievers are characterized yeah, they in no way submit. In fact, they uh, they they are characterized by the word irritating them. It might aggravate them. It might exasperate them. And uh, because they have a predisposition against the things of God, so they're not so they're not uh, going to be submissive in any way. And I said, uh, for example, in Second Timothy three you get a characterization of an ungodly person where it says they resist the truth. And what's the truth? The Word of God is the truth. So, ungodly people resist the truth. And that word, uh, in the Greek, it's uh, anthispeimi, means to stand, it means to actively oppose. It means to take an anti-position. That's the that first part of that word. Anthis means anti Tamian means uh, to stand. So it's an anti-position. So what the Word of God says is that unbelievers actively stand against God. That's what it says. Okay? And then later in, in the Second Timothy, I mentioned in 4.15, where it mentions Alexander the coppersmith, who did a lot of evil. And the, it says the Lord report, uh, awarded him according to his works. But he also said, you must also beware of him, for he is, has greatly resisted our words. That's the same thought. He's resisted our words, okay? As Paul writes to Timothy. So the same idea there, and that's a, a typical picture of an unbeliever who is in opposition to the word of God. The word of God. It's like, remember we talked about the parables of the soil? It's like the hard soil. For the soil that has the rock underneath it, they they only hear they hear the word for a amount of time, and then they they shut themselves off to the word. Most often, when there's a price to pay, when Christianity is convenient for people, it's it's, uh, it's pretty easy. But when it gets when there's a price to pay, oftentimes that causes people to walk away from God. Uh, so it's like the hard soil, the soil with the rock underneath. They only hear for so long and then they shut it off. Uh, or the weedy soil. You know, people that come to church and they spring up like a weed. They spring up and they're, they're gung-ho for like six months and then you don't see them anymore. Are those people saved? I don't know. But there's, a, there's, a, there's an indication uh, that they might not be. So... You know, for us to be functioning as the Lord wants us to function, we have to give up the things of the world and, and the cares of this age and the deceitfulness of riches. Those are all phrases used in the Word. We have to forget those things. Okay? So those are 
things that we have to be able to resist ourselves. We have to be actively able to oppose those things. But typically, the unbelieving mind resists the truth. Just as typically, a, the believing mind receives God's word with submission. Whenever you run into Christians that are uh, that don't have an attitude of submission about their life, then you should be you should you should be concerned about them. And I want I want you to look now in your source text at First James one nineteen, and I want you to see how this whole idea is tucked within this first verse. In verse nine one nineteen in James it says. It says, so then, my beloved brethren. So let's stop right there. Five words, we'll stop. We don't want to go too far. My beloved brethren. Uh, we'll pull that phrase out a little bit. It's also back, I think it's in uh, 116. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And James, see, James is very sensitive and very concerned. And he's very compassionate. And he shows a lot of love as he exhorts these people that he's writing this letter to. And he, he calls them his beloved brothers, brethren. Uh, and that's a, that's a phrase that he uses repetitively in this letter. He calls them his brothers again in chapter 2 and in chapter 3. So James has a very loving heart towards these people. But let me also tell you, he's very strong in his exhortation. He doesn't pull any punches with them. He tells them the truth and he tells it to them very bluntly. Now this verse begins with the words in my Bible, so then. Does anybody have anything else? Therefore. Therefore. This you know. This you know. My dear brothers and sisters. It doesn't have anything before that? Oh, that's New Living Translation. Okay. No, it's not. Some will say where, where, some will say, wherefore, therefore, this you know, New King James says, so then. And, uh, you know, it's as uh, uh, Brother John Moore said, as I say, whenever you have that kind of phrase there, you need to ask yourself why. But this is what we call in the Greek. In Greek, it, this is called a variant reading. It's a variant reading. And the word that most Bibles translate from the Greek to open that verse is the word hoste, H-O-S-T-E. The only problem with that word is, is that's a word that's, that, that is not used in the better manuscripts. The better manuscripts use the word histe, H-I-S-T-E. One letter difference, H-O-S-T-E, H-I-S-T-E, okay? That's all the difference, at least in English. It, there's, a, there's more of a dis, dis, uh, difference in the Greek. And like I said, the better manuscripts, and what do I mean by better manuscripts? Manuscripts that are, uh, uh, there's, they are ascribed to having greater accuracy. The better manuscripts have the word histe. And that is better translated as Mary said, this you know. And when you look at the context of the writing, the reason why he stay works is because he stay fits into the context. And that's why the writer used. You could use either word. You could use Jose, which is in some manuscripts. You could use he stay. But the word he stay better fits. This you know. Uh, so what is he saying then? When, when James opens this 19th verse, he's, he's, he's saying... This you know. And what that means is he's playing off the 18th verse. He says, he makes this statement in the 18th verse, and then he says, This you know, my beloved brother. You know what I've just told you in the 18th verse. And what did he tell us in the 18th verse? The I just lost the juice. First fruits. My fruits. Hello? Can you hear us? No. No. I just lost.
So he says, now remember we've looked at that verse in depth, okay? What he's saying is that by the power of the word, okay, that Uh, 
uh, Deuteronomy 8 3. So, even back then, God wanted mankind to entertain the fact, not the idea, the fact that you could be fed by the Word of God. And if you would, if you would, if you would dwell upon that Word, it would be life-changing for you. So all Scripture is given that the man of God may be perfect, right? Uh, thoroughly furnished unto good works. 2 Timothy 3.15. Listen to the whole text. I just took part of it. It says, from childhood, this is Paul writing to, to Timothy. From childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. How? How did Timothy know the Scriptures? From his mom. His mama. His mama and his grandmama taught him the Scriptures. Okay? From childhood, childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay? Saved by faith, which is in uh, faith in Christ. And then he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It's good, it's good to live uh, your life by. It's good for reproof, okay? It's good for correction, okay? And it's good for instruction because it's all contained within God's, and it says, in righteousness. And then he says that the man, then he says, because of that, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for good work. Okay? So, the word that you and I have experienced has the power to make us a new creation. And then, as a new creation, we have to be willing to yield to his power. And then when we do that, because... He's first and we're not. It causes us, it causes us then to grow. You know, on the radio station, I'm uh, on the radio program on Sunday mornings, I'm teaching on, remember we did, uh, Is This Our Faith? Where we figured out how we grow our faith, which is by glorifying God. Okay? This is very closely intertwined with that idea. If you want to grow your faith, you have to be submissive. How do, you, how, are, how do you become submissive? You have to be obedient. You have to be obedient. So the whole idea, all of these things are intertwined. And by when we continually, faithfully, hear the word of life, which is the word of God, the power, you have, when you get saved, you have a new nature, but how, what are you like? According to the word, you're a baby. Okay? And as you... And to grow, what does the baby have to do? It has to eat. It has to, it has to have some sort of consumption. So, as you, and that, the thing about, I believe that the Word of God is a self-perpetuating uh, maturity machine, for lack of a better phrase. As you become, as you begin to consume God's Word, it becomes self-stimulating. And it causes you to want more word, and more word, and more word, and more word, okay? And we're going to see, if we go all the way to verse 22, uh, we're going to see that process, that action, uh, how it works. But remember I talked about, I talked about if you want to, if you want to be, to receive God's word, you have to turn your spiritual dial to God's radio station. Remember when you used to have dials on your radio and you had to, you had to focus in on them? I still have one of those radios. I listen to them in the backyard when I'm gardening. And I have to, I have to mess around with it to get 790 out of Tucson because I like to listen to talk radio. So I have to mess with it some. But you have to, you have to turn into the channel that God is broadcasting on. You can turn to any channel you want. But are you going to receive what God's broadcasting if you're not tuning into His station? No, you're going, to, you're going to get something else. But when you begin, when you get properly tuned in, when you can hear and then receive, that stimulates that new nature that you have within you into action. It begins to become more and more of who you are. And this all begins with an attitude 
of hearing the Word of God by being receptive to it. And the problem is that most of us, we have selective hearing. We like this part, that part's good. We like this part, yeah, most of the time. But this part over here, that, that ain't that good. So we, we want to be able to select what it is we want to hear. But that doesn't work right. See, God says He brought us forth by the Word so that we will live by the Word. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Everything. <coughs> Consumed them. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 2 speaks about uh, a desire for the milk of uh, God's Word. So, notice in verse uh, 19 then, going back to verse 19, he says, okay, so we've got what, what, what did he say again, Mary, in your version? Yes, you know. <laughs> Am I trying to emphasize that part? I think you are. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just so you know. This you know, my beloved brethren. And then he says, let every man. Okay? He says, let every man. Uh, this you know. Let every man. He, he says, this you know, what I've already told you in verse 18. And then he says, let every man. So what he really says is when he says let every man, he's adding now to verse 18. He's going to make a, you know, I like to use that word caveat. He's going to add a PS and he's going to tell you, okay, I've told you part of what I want you to know in verse 18, but now let every man, and, and he's going to go on further. You know, the, the, the power of the word uh, is, is unto salvation. And let everyone follow these imperatives. And then he gives three imperatives, okay? He says, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So let's talk about the first one. Swift to hear. What does that mean? Listen. Okay. In your ears? Pay attention and um, understand. I think. Is he saying he, he wants you to be a good listener? Obey the first time. Obey the first time?
It talks about the tongue specifically in chapter 3. But here, the issue is how you respond to the word, okay? How you respond to the word. Behaving beliefs or beliefs that make us behave, that cause us to behave. And in verse 18, the word of truth is mentioned, okay? I'm going to show you that. What's the context that surrounds the 19th verse? In verse 18, it mentions the word of truth. Verse 21, the implanted word is mentioned. Verse 22 says to be doers of the word. Verse 23 describes the word as a glass or a mirror. In verse 25, it's called the perfect law of liberty unto which you look. The, the word of what the theme is, the context of James at this point in the first chapter is the word of God. So he's speaking to you in regards to the word of God. He says, be swift to hear. And what does he mean? What does he want you to listen to? The word of God, okay? So when we say he wants us to be good listeners, let's zero in. It's how you, see James' concern, James, James wants you to respond to the word of God. That is his, in your outline, the word is concern. James is concerned that these believers aren't responding to the word of God appropriately. And actually, the text in the Greek, when you, when you translate the text, the Greek says, be quick to hearing. Be quick to hearing. You can write that in your Bibles. Be quick to hearing. That's what it really says in Greek. Uh, and when it says to be quick to hearing, it pro provides a motif that, to me, paints a picture. What are you hearing? What are you hearing? How do you hear the Word of God? You hear it in a Sunday school lesson. You hear it in a sermon. You may hear it when somebody else is reading Scripture. You hear it in the exposition of the Word of God. That's what I try to do on Sunday morning an exposition of the Word of God. And all of those things, I think, are what James is, James is talking about. And he's telling people, be quick to hear these things. Because as, you, as we go along, you're going to see more of the context of what he's talking about here. The idea is, then is that, listen, God's people should be eager to grasp every opportunity to increase their hearing of God's Word. Let me say that again. Okay, I will. God's people should be eager to grasp every opportunity to increase their hearing of God's word, irrespective of who or how, as long as it is the correct word of God. And I'm not going to, listen, I'm not making this up. I don't have to belabor the text. I don't have to pull things out of here so that you'll, so that I can get you to listen to me. This is what James is teaching. I think it's essentially what the text is attempting to convey when he uses these words here. It means to pursue every... See, see, people don't come to church on Sunday night because they don't want to. And the problem is, is that they don't understand is that to hear the Word of God is not, it is not something to be taken for granted. In fact, to hear the Word of God should be taken as a privilege. To hear the word of God <coughs> properly exposed, and that's my responsibility, not yours. Your responsibility is to tell me when I'm not exposing it properly. But to hear the word of God properly exposed is a privilege. For people, you can't get people to come Sunday night. It's hard to get people to come Wednesday night. They don't think it's a privilege. They think it's a duty. It's it's a it's a work. And that's, that's what's part of what's wrong with our churches. But uh, the, to have the opportunity, the privilege to gain, you know, I, you know, the greatest privilege of my job is that I gain more truth of God's Word as I study God's Word. You know, that's Roger. That's one, I don't know how many times Roger has talked to me about that. How by teaching he has grown in the Lord. Amen. And that's what's the great thing about teaching, but You've got to be careful because the teaching's coming up next. And so you've got to be careful. 
But the mark of a believer, of a true believer, is that they desire to obtain the knowledge of God and God's will for their life. Okay? You, saw, you show me someone who has no desire. Listen, I can stay at home and go to church. No, you can't. That's totally unbiblical. You can't stay at home and go to church. That's not, that's not, what, that's not the, the intent. Because by being under someone else's teaching, you are illuminated to other thoughts. You know, that's why it's good to have more than one teacher. And that's why we're going to teach a the special Sunday school series where you get a, a thought process completely outside of the realm as, as I think, or as Roger thinks, or as Tom thinks. You'll be exposed to somebody else's thought process. But if somebody doesn't have a desire to be under the teaching of God, I'll, some, I'll show you somebody who does not have the mark of being a true Christian. Yeah, I'll say that. You don't have to. I'll, show, I'll say that. If you show me that somebody that does not want to be under God's teaching, I'll show you somebody that does not have the mark of being a true Christian. James is blunt. I can be blunt too. True believers, listen, true believers back in the first century ran to hear the word of God. You know, they walked miles and miles to hear the word of God. And as I've said before, listen, when there are trials in your life, as we the first part of this chapter speaks of, that's the first thing that James spoke of was trials. Uh, when you have difficulties in your life, you know how you get through trials? By strength and wisdom. How do you get strength and wisdom? By consuming the Word of God. You know, the Word provides the answers for your trials. The next part of this first chapter talks about temptations. When you are tested to your very limit, how do you get away from that test? How do you, how do you survive the test? You go to the Word of God. That's why it's important to have Scripture in, inside your hearts. So that you can hold on to those things and instantaneously bring them to your mind. It's through the power of the Word of God that you can resist temptation. It's the idea behind uh, Psalm 119 in verse 11. It says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin. That's the whole idea. So then, what we're saying is that the word is the source of the deliverance out of trials. The word is the source of deliverance out of temptation. So, the word of God should be a welcome friend to you and to your family. It should be something that you embrace in your home as something that is there for your benefit. Because the Word of God actually engages us. And when you are, when you are in God's Word, you are in communion with God. And listen, uh, the idea that if you're a believer and you desire to communicate with God, remember, do you remember the old commercials? Remember E.F. Hutton? Yeah. What happened when E.F. Hutton spoke? Everybody listened. Do you remember those commercials? Shows you how my mind works. I remember those commercials. I think I was a kid. I don't know how old I was. But. So, when God speaks, those who love Him and this involves listening to those who preach and listening to those who teach as long as they're true to the Word of God. And you, So you can ask yourself this question. It's the question I asked you Sunday morning, or God asked you Sunday morning. Uh, you can right now, let's just stop. Everybody close your eyes. Do an inventory. This is between you and God. I don't know. You don't have to, and I don't expect you to tell me. Let me ask you a question. Are you hungry for the Word of God? That's the only question. On the, on the, question, on the, on the questionnaire, there's only one question. Are you hungry for the Word of God? Okay, you can, you can open that. Or, or is, listen, because, man, I don't want the Word of God to be a burden for you. If the Word of God is a burden for you, there's a problem. If you wake up in the morning and say, oh, I get to read my Bible. Night. That ain't what it's all about. It shouldn't be a burden. You know, you know, 
you know, I get to sit, I get to stand up here, so I get to see everybody that's false. <laughs> and you know, I feel sorry for some problems. Some probably have like sleep apnea and stuff, and they don't get a lot of rest. I know because I have sleep apnea. Uh, I, but the ones that I'm always, the ones I like are the ones that are. Yeah. Now they'll look at their watch, usually around the top of the hour, <laughs> and then about ten minutes later you'll see them again, and about five minutes later. And they just, they just keep watching that watch. And sometimes when they do, I want to be spiteful and just keep on talking. <laughs> I don't do that because I don't have any more material. <laughs> but it's true, you know. Uh, are you coming, you know, what are your, listen to me. You should be unrestrained. You should have no constraints when it comes to your desire to consume the Word of God. Are you a person that can take it or leave it? Or do you have a desire to learn the Word of God? <clears throat> because you should have a desire to learn the Word of God. Uh, how big do you want to grow as a Christian? You want to be little? You want to be big? Charles Wesley, uh, this, these words are from a hymn. Uh, I wrote them down a long time ago. I don't know the name of the hymn. I just wrote down the words of the hymn. I don't think I've ever heard it sung. But Wesley wrote, that's... That's the, the other Wesley. When quiet in my room I sit, thy book my companion still. When quiet in my room, I have my Bible. And then he says, my joy thy sayings to repeat. I love to repeat your word. Taking more the records of thy will so I can record what your will is and search the oracles divine till every heart, listen, Till every heartfelt word is mine. Every heartfelt word is mine. That's a great desire to have. I talked to you earlier about Psalm 119. Again in Psalm 119, in verse 111, it says, Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever. Listen, if you don't like the word of God, you don't like reading the Bible, what do you think heaven's going to be like? Now you're not going to go to Sunday school class. But I think you're going to hear a lot of the same things that are contained in this book of, in heaven. And then he says, your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever. Because your word, I'm going to be with you forever. For they are the rejoicing of my heart. Uh, I read another writer who said, we might wonder why the ever practical James, and he's talking about what James wrote here in one of the commentaries I was reading, he says, we might wonder why the ever-practical James, James is considered very pragmatic and very practical in his writing, does not proceed to outline schemes of daily Bible study for us. For surely these are the ways in which we offer a willing ear to the voice of God. But he does not help us in this way. Rather, he goes deeper. For there's little point, listen to this, you want to do Bible study, okay? Listen to what he says. There's little point in schemes and times if we do not have an attentive spirit. You know, I have people come to me and they say, how do I read the Bible? The first thing I usually tell them is, open a book. <laughs> and then after they're kind of shocked, then I'll give them a Bible reading plan. The biggest hindrance to people reading the Bible is they don't open the book. If you don't open the book, you're not going to you read it. You know, I did a lesson Sunday morning in Sunday school. Half of my lesson I did on how to study your Bible. Remember? And, I, and if, you, if anybody wants the notes to that, it's a simple plan on how to become Bible uh, knowledgeable people. I don't expect you to be experts, but I want you to be knowledgeable. Uh, that same person wrote, it's the idea, you've got to be thirsty. Remember Sunday morning? He continues, it's possible to be unfailingly regular in Bible reading, but achieve no more than having moved the bookmark forward. This is reading unrelented to an, un, to an attentive spirit. The word is read but not heard. On the other hand, if we can develop an attentive spirit, this will spur us to create those conditions, a proper method in Bible reading, a discipline of our time 
and so on, by which the spirit will find itself satisfied in hearing the word of God. That's a very interesting idea. Do you know that the Holy Spirit wants you to be reading God's word? Because it puts you in perfect communion with the Father and the Spirit. And it illuminates the Son to you. It gives you a Trinity-wide experience. So it's very important. But the true believer is going to be earmarked by that desire, that hunger, that thirst. And, and uh, it, it's true, listen to me, sometimes we all get dulled in this area. You know how we get dulled? Usually we get wrapped up in the things of the world. The world pushes in, Satan pushes in on our time, and he tries to change our, our methods, he tries to change our routine. And when that happens, we can, we can have some dullness in our desire. We can, uh, we can, have, we can lose some of our longing. And, but when we're not fed, but what happens when you don't, if you're really a consumer of the Word of God, you know what happens when you don't get fed for a couple days? You get really hungry. So there should be that longing. But what happens to people is if they get away from the Word too long, they just forget that desire. That desire goes away. So again, how, e how eager are you this evening to receive the Word of God? How eager are you to come into the Lord's uh, house in the morning, in the evening? How eager are you to learn the Word of God, to read a, a, a great book? Uh, and it's so much more than a book that it describes to you all the spiritual truths that you need to know. How eager are, are, how eager are you to... Uh, to run a, a Bible study so you're, that your heart can be opened as you open other people's hearts. How are eager are you to go into a quiet place or a private place and open the Word of God before God and commune with Him? James says, if you want to test yourself in regards to your submissive, submissiveness to the Word, start with being swift to hear, okay? And the second thing, and I'll, I'll go just a little bit more. The second thing he says, he says he wants you to be what? Slow to speak. So what does that mean? Think before you speak. Okay. He's not talking be deliberate in your speech. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, he's not talking about social relationships. Remember the context. The word of God. Be slow before you speak the word of God. That's what he's talking to you about. In the, root, in the Greek, when you translate it literally from the Greek, it says, slow for the speaking. Be slow for the speaking. So, the hearing defines us. Uh, if the hearing, if you bought into my first conjecture, which was being swift to hear has to do with the, uh, the exposition of Scripture, then my second conjecture is that to be to be uh, slow uh, slow to speak has to also do with the exposition of scripture. So hearing hearing if hearing has to do with that in its context. If hearing has to do with listening to a sermon or teaching a Sunday school lesson, what he's saying here is he's told you to be quick to listen to that first thing. But if you're speaking, you better be slow to speak. You know why? Because you've got a lot of responsibility. More than the normal Christian does. In other words, don't ever presume to... Listen to me. When you teach, you stand up and you presume to speak for God. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. You are speaking and saying, this is what I believe God means to say to you today. That's the way I look at it. And his word, unless you are prepared, prepared uh, for all that encompasses, you you would be, you would be better, better off to be very slow to speak. You know, we eager, if we eagerly pursue every opportunity to hear the word taught, every opportunity to hear the word pro proclaimed, but if we're and then if we're cautious, slow, patience, we should. Those are the attributes we... Listen, if we want people to be eager to hear, we need to be cautious when we speak. Because you don't want to speak.
speak an untruth. Because untruths do a whole bunch of damage. They do individual damage and they do church damage. So patience, uh, the, 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 the word in your outline is speaker. Patiently, with great reluctance, we would be the speaker of the word of God. I don't know if I've ever, I don't know if I've ever said this to you as a group of people, but I have to confess to you that the exercise of preaching, I believe, is the manifestation of my gift from God. I think uh, I'm, I think I'm a, somewhat of an exhorter, uh, but really uh, to examine and uh, take apart God's word and try to explain it to you is my gift. And, I can't honestly say to you that I I believe I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, but I can't I can't say to you that I rush to preach because if I find it exhilarating, uh, I can I can in fact I can honestly tell you that I have a certain amount of reluctance in my heart every time I come to speak to you, and that's the reluctance I felt Sunday morning. And I think my reluctance mainly is based upon a fear that somehow I might misrepresent the truth of God. Uh, even though I feel I was called to do this, there's, I have a reluctance to be God's mouthpiece because I don't want to misrepresent what He has to say to you whenever I try to speak to you. Uh, and I worry about the process. I worry about the whole thing. Uh, you know, when I... When I spoke to you on Sunday morning, God changed the sermon during the second song. Uh, we sang one song, then we had meeting greet, and then we sang another song. We changed the sermon during the second song. And uh, I like to be in control. You may have noticed that. And I was so utterly out of control. And I was almost subdued by the whole, by the whole manifestation of the Spirit. And I, I'll, the reason I tell you those things is so that you'll understand that it has to be about God and not about us. It has to be about God. So, when you look, when you look at where we're at here, I want you to look up. Look, in, in, in this big context, look at verse 3. In verse 3, in the first, in, in James, what does the verse, first verse mean? My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Uh, really, in the Greek, that means stop. Stop being so many teachers. That's what that in the Greek means. It's, so James is saying too many of you are teaching. And why, why does he want you to stop, to be, stop being a teacher? Because uh, knowing that you shall receive, everybody wants to teach, knowing that you should receive, but this says a stricter judgment. The, let, the standard will be higher for you. Don't you? Uh, that you'll receive a greater judgment because we know everybody, you know, listen to me, everybody's going to stumble. Everybody's going to fall. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to say things wrong. But when you're speaking for God, the expectation is that you're not going to fail. Yeah. So whatever you say, uh, so what, what? going back to our original text in, in 119, he's saying, don't be in a hurry. If you, if you find yourself teaching and if you're in a hurry because you're not properly prepared, you'd be better off not saying anything. Don't be in a hurry. Be prepared. Be ready. Make sure that you've got your eyes dotted and your T's crossed. Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 at our church in Clovis, we used to have what we call preacher boys. And Dr. Tom Rush would try to identify young men that he felt could eventually become preachers. But that, and I, but the problem is, is when some of those young people are newly converted, what we might call novices. See, it's very easy to get caught up in the celebrity of being a speaker. Okay, because people. Look, are looking at you all the time. And it can be hard for you to keep a humble heart about it. So you have to be real careful, especially when you entertain young people to do that type of thing. 
And, you know, I, I encourage Tom to preach because I, I actually feel Tom may have a calling on his life. I don't think Tom always believes that, but uh, I know uh, the Lord has kind of led me to, that he has a, the ability at least uh, to follow in that kind of vein and be used of God. But before you stand before people, you have to be very, very slow. And you have to, you have to be, uh, those of us in leadership have to be very aware of the pitfalls. Timothy 1, uh, 1 Timothy 3, 6 speaks to the idea that no one should ever embark upon the rule of a teacher, a pastor, a teacher, an elder, uh, a bishop, if he's a novice, it says. Okay? 1 Timothy 3, 6. And, and, and then it answers why, because it says he'll be ten, tended to be lifted up with pride, and then what? And then it says, uh, what, what, what was the condemnation of the devil? Pride. Okay? That's what condemned the devil, was it not? He wanted to be God. Uh, they'll fall into the same, I think it says, they'll fall into the same condemnation the devil fell into when he was pride. And that's why the devil was kicked out of heaven. So, uh, what we, uh, you know, because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of great ministry opportunities. Uh, you know where most churches have their, their ministry problems? Uh, youth pastors and music leaders. Do you know that? Notoriously, historically, that's where a lot of the, of the problems in churches are because they end up thinking uh, a little too highly of themselves. So it's, uh, and uh, uh, think about churches you've been to and think about the, the conditions of some of those ministries. So I think I'm going to stop there because it's time. Let me make a note. Let me stop. So what's your question? Do you have any questions?